So this morning I want us to look at features of true fellowship with God. Now as we look at our passage here this morning in 2 Samuel chapter 15, we have recorded for us the next stages in David's life, which of course has been, I believe, an epic journey as we have gone through the various chapters in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel so far. You will remember that from the last message that now David has entered into the second period, period of his exile, and he has crossed over those murky and, as I described last time, those symbolic waters of Kidron, which were really paralleling and uh, showing us in a typical form the very uh, crossing over of Kijon of the Lord Jesus Christ into the Garden of Gethsemane. We, last time we, we drew some tremendous comparisons between the sorrows of Christ and the sorrows of David as he is in many respects expelled because of the betrayal of his son Absalom. And there he is running for his life. He is in exile. The question that we ask ourselves is what was his spiritual condition at this stage of his life? And what was the frame of mind of David as he comes now into this second part of his journey? Now, given the fact that he was a lot older, you would expect that he would be a bit more experienced and seasoned with the experiences of life and the actions of people. When he first ran away from the jealousy of Saul, uh, there, of course, was a certain youthfulness about David. And there was this great passion of David. So we might wonder to ourselves, now that he's entered into a second period of exile and running away, has he learnt? Has he drawn from the previous experiences? What can we tell about David's life at this particular stage? Remember that his family had grown. Whether he was on his own, or we can say that he was in the early stages of his, of his home life, now the family was large. Now there were the comforts and the certain eases and pleasures of the palace life. And all these things had been torn away from him. And then you add to that and it compounds the problem. The fact that he had suffered the pain and the hurt of not just loved ones who had died, his own children, but also that he experienced betrayal and treachery at the hands of individuals that he trusted that he confided in. It would be easy to assume that things were now not well with him. That maybe David had just given up. That he had maybe given up on himself because of his own backslidings and sins. Maybe he had given up in a sort of human respect on the sovereignty and the providence of God. Why am I here again? Why am I in these situations? However, that is not the case. While David knew that all that he was now enduring was part and parcel of the righteous, chastening hand of God upon his life, we should not conclude as a result that David was unable to live godly or in faith. What you find in this passage before you is that David is living in faith. And that David is, in many respects, learning from his past experiences. And as he continues on with his journey, it is that we find commendable and godly aspects of his life. And they come once more to the fore and to our attention. I believe they tend to shine all the brighter against the dark backdrop of his own trials. And you know, that's a very common experience in the Christian life. That the very virtues and the very beauties of grace in the life of the true child of God, they don't tend to shine during the day of prosperity when all things are well. But just as we see the stars more clearly and more intensely against the backdrop of the darkness of the night, so there is a certain sense in which the, the fruits of the Spirit and the signs of grace within your life, they come before people when you are tried, when you are tested. And when I study David's life, as we have done for quite a while now, do you not think that is the pattern of behavior? That when he's at ease, it's when the problems come. But when he is tried and tested, and when all things seem to be against him, he stands and he's counted as a child of God. And I think for that reason alone, as well as many things that could be said, we should never despise the times when God is trying us. And when chastening or certain trials come our way. 
So we see uh, that particular side of, of David here. We also see, as we shall see towards the end in a sort of brief comment, that again, despite all this, um, David's flesh uh, rise up in sort of uh, rebellion at times as well. And, and what that just reminds me of is that we are in a struggle in the battle. You know, I'm not surprised when I study David's life that I see all these peaks and all these troughs and I, and I see all of these times when he's going on and, and then plunged into despair because I remind myself that, well, that's just where we all are as Christians. Do we not read in Galatians 5, 7, the words of the Apostle Paul, the flesh lasteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, doesn't he? He says that these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. And so Paul is spot on when he's analyzing and assessing our Christian life. Uh, and he's saying that there's a battle that rages. And it's, and it's not going away anytime soon. And so we should not think to ourselves that David's life is somehow surprising. Now, certainly certain things he did might astonish us. But this up and down pattern of his life, it is uh, reflecting really how we are as Christians. We need to deal with it. We need to uh, seek to go on with God and to grow in sanctification. So then, as we come to our message this morning, I've identified in this passage certain features of true fellowship with God. We say that we have fellowship with him. We say that we walk with him. Well, what are the features of true fellowship with God? There are many things I could say, by the way. Don't take this as being comprehensive and saying, well, that, this is all it means to have fellowship with God. I'm simply seeking to summarize the chapter and the passage here and stay true to the, uh, the context of what we have before us this morning. First of all, the true fellowship of God will prioritize the glory of God before self-interests. True fellowship with God will prioritize the glory of God before, if I can make it more simple, yourself and before self-interests. Look at me at verse 24 and verse 25. And lo, Zadok also, and all the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God, and Abiathar went up until the people had done passing out the city. Then read this. The king said to Zadok, carry back the ark of God into the city. And I just pause there with those words. It is again in these particularly trying occasions of David's life where we find that the, the pain and the, the treachery that foreshadows and provides for us a typical picture of the Lord Jesus Christ when he suffered in a very similar way comes to the fore again. And I want us to make this a very uh, particular point this morning. Before we even begin to explore and think, well, how did David prioritize the glory of God in his life. We must appreciate his own experiences as best as we possibly can. Now, for us to do that, we come back to this comparison that I've made throughout the series. David as the type of Jesus Christ. David and the greater David. It is one of the keys of our interpretation of David's life. And we should not abandon it. We should hold very close to it. So when you study the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, do you not find something quite fascinating about Jesus' life? You find at the very beginning, there was a great surge, wasn't there? And I think that's true in human nature about any particular thing. When there's a novelty or when there's something new that is taking place, there is a surge of interest. And I'm not making comparisons between the ministry of Christ and, you know, insignificant things, but I'm just drawing an observation about human nature. That when a crowd runs after something, others, they start to follow in that same direction. Now, John the Baptist had a tremendous ministry, a powerful influence, and that had pointed many people to the Savior. And as the Lord Jesus began to minister, of course, what accompanied his ministry but miracles. And you have the miracles in Cana, you have the miracles through other regions of Israel and Judea and so forth. And people began to swell the ranks of the numbers that followed Christ. But as the Lord Jesus began to develop his ministry and to preach and to speak, I'm not saying that he deceived the people because at the beginning he preached repentance. 
He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. But as he began to penetrate into the human heart of man, and he began to speak of the great demands of what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, it became clear that hearts were under scrutiny. And hearts were being examined, weren't they? And they were being deeply challenged by the word of God. And they found the words of Christ to be hard. They couldn't accept everything that he was saying. And so we read on occasions that many no longer walked with him. And when multitudes began to abandon the very company of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you find those who are true coming to the fore. Those disciples whose hearts had been touched, in whom a work of grace had been done. And they showed loyalty, and they showed faithfulness. David, years before, typifies this. He foreshadows it. And he provides a similar picture because, as I've indicated, he was betrayed by Absalom, his son. He was betrayed by that man who I find very hard to pronounce, Ahithophel. And I'm so far doing well, I believe, in my pronunciation of uh, his name. He was, of course, the closest of counselors. He was the most intimate of friends. David confided in this individual. And then he betrayed him. He stabbed him in the back, if we use that particular saying, as we often do. But David also found out who were his true friends. And it's at such times those sort of things always take place. And so in verse 24, we read that the Levites were on his side. You have, of course, the high priest, Abiathar, and his assistant, if I can use that expression for Zadok, he was more or less the assistant of the high priest. But look at David's instruction to Zadok. He says to him in verse 25, take the ark of God back. See, they have it. The Levites have charge of the ark of the covenant. We've, we've looked at that on previous occasions. And you would think to yourself, David, take it with you. Take the Ark of the Covenant with you. Don't, don't send it back. Why? Because remember how the Ark of the Covenant was the most powerful symbol of the presence of Almighty God. So much so that a careless handling of the Ark of the Covenant brought about the loss of life. And yet the careful handling of it brought about the blessing of God. David knows the worth of the Ark of the Covenant. Is David really prepared to go on his journey and to send it back into the city? He is because he knows it's where it belongs. It's where it belongs. And David also is very much aware that he too suffered in a respect by the mishandling of the Ark of the Covenant. And as he is presently under the chastening, correcting hand of God, it appears that David feels almost unworthy. I'm not going to be blasé about this. I'm not going to be casual in my approach. He could have thought to himself, you know, if I take the Ark of the Covenant, I'll be blessed. I have God on my side. But what does he do? He places the glory of God before his own self-preservation and his self-interest. And this we know should be always the mindset of the believer. You can transport this truth into our present day and age. You can make application of this to your own heart this morning. In other words, what we can say is that we should be very careful that we do not suit ourselves to sort of please ourselves first and we have God as an add-on at the end. And many of God's professing people, and I think all of us at some point in time, we are guilty of that. That in arranging all of our personal situations in life, that we have made sure that everything else is in its rightful place, and then we make time for God at the end. And we wonder why things are not turning out as we wished or wanted them to. Even if it means we become uncomfortable by putting God first and his glory first, the ultimate end is that we are blessed of God, as David was. And so he does the right thing here, which is refreshing, seeing as he'd done so many things which had wrong beforehand. He doesn't put himself first. He puts the glory of God first. Furthermore, let me add, by way of looking to the New Testament scriptures, uh, that 
when we do this, you will begin to discover that it is always for the furtherance of the gospel. And should that not be your real interest and desire? It should be mine and yours as Christians. The Apostle Paul, I remember someone always reading this me many years ago when there was a difficult time and uh, a brother in Christ read this verse in respect to personal situations. And Paul said in Philippians 1 and 12, but I would, you should understand, brethren, think of how he begins that sentence, understand this, brethren. Don't just listen to what I'm saying and let it just go on past you, past your ears and past your mind and past your heart. Understand what I say, that the things which happened unto me, all my sufferings, all my afflictions, all the betrayal of people, all my hardships, Paul says, they have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. You know, the average unsaved person will say, you are very unfortunate. No, Paul says, God is working these things together for good. And it's not just my good. Um, that, would, that would be selfish if you think of it in that respect, not just my good, but his good is the furtherance of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So dear brother and sister in Christ, what should feature in your fellowship with God prioritize the glory of God before your self-interest? You've got decisions to make this year in 2017. You've got options you can take, places that you can go to. You've got things that you need to do but are you prioritizing the glory of God? Are you putting him first? Are you consulting him? That lead, leads us really nicely to our second point this morning. That fellowship with God or features of our fellowship with God. Um, secondly, that we accept the will of God as being central in all things. God's will should be central in all things to us. Again, look at verse 25 and notice really the end of Verse 25, it says, If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it and his habitation. And then verse 26, But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here am I. Or you could just read that last phrase, Behold, I. Behold, it's me. I'm willing, Lord. I'm willing. Let him do to me as seemeth good unto him. The more I read that verse, the more I am deeply challenged by it. Let that be my theme. Let that be our mantra. Let him do what seemeth right and good unto him. One of the abiding problems that you face, and I believe that I'm saying something of which we all recognize readily this morning, is the ability to accept God's will and all that it entails in our life. The reason why I say it is one of the abiding problems is that we as Christians really don't have much difficulty talking about the will of God. And we could talk about it in a sort of reckless fashion. We say, well, if God wills. Well, what if God wills? And that takes you into a place that you don't want to be. You see, what we're saying when we say, if God wills, it is... A very um, challenging phrase and expression. We, we readily accept that we must live within the center of God's will, but we ask ourselves the question, what quite is it to live in the center of God's will? And what impact is it having upon our Christian life? Believer, we must set the will of God as a king upon the throne of our heart. That's what we're dealing with here. It's not my will, as the Lord Jesus says, but thy will be done. And, and the struggle that we have with this should never be underestimated in our life. Again, I think the only way to illustrate this is to go again to Christ and to remember Gethsemane and to remember how he struggled in that particular way. The God-man on the dust of the ground with his face to the earth let the cup pass. Let the cup pass from me. Our Lord Jesus, knowing that it was a bitter cup indeed, but he resigns himself and he submits himself quite willingly to the very will of God. Now let's apply this practically to the Christian life. What is the will of God in as many respects that it is revealed to us? Remember the will of God, and I'm tying this out now with David's life. The will of God for us is our sanctification. 
Now, why do I say that? I say it because Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, when he was writing to another church, he said in chapter 4, verses 2 and 4, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. So can you please take note that he is referring to the commandments of Christ, who, of course, what did Jesus do? He did not destroy the law of God, did he? He didn't come and say, you know, the Ten Commandments are all done dusted, and you don't have to live by them anymore. You're under grace. No, he, uh, whenever we think of grace reigning in our hearts, is that the condemnation of God's law is no longer upon us. We certainly live by the commands. Why? Because it is the very nature of God and his character. And so the Lord Jesus fulfills the law. He qualifies. He explains. In fact, what he does, he doesn't narrow the field. He broadens the commands. And he goes into the very spirit of the law of God. Paul calls upon that, and he says, you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. So Paul is backing this up. We ought to be an obedient people. That's God's will. And he goes on to say, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. And everyone should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. The type of Christianity that goes around today is nothing like this. It is reckless. It is without any sort of restriction. And it's sort of kicking out and saying, well, anyone who teaches the law of God as a, still a powerful influence upon the Christian is, is a legalist. They have not understood what that term means. When you hear people saying that, they have no idea what that term means. It's just using it for the sake of it. I remind you that the word of God becomes very clear. The commandments still hold true. It is a way of life for us. We do it joyfully out of a redeemed heart. And surely David is knowing the, the keen and sharp edge of this sword, isn't he? He knows what it was to betray the Lord and to let him down to sin so grievously. We see in David's life the raging battle in this particular respect, but I think he should be commended now for the way he now speaks and talks. Go back to our passage there, 2 Samuel 15 and verse 25. I'm sure in his heart he would have been very keen to stay in the palace. Go back to Jerusalem. Go back to somewhere where there would have been more comfort and more ease, of course, if it wasn't for Absalom uh, being there. But he, he speaks in submissive terms, doesn't he? And the way in which that, that David talks now is to be our language, Christian. This is how we should talk. It's how we should speak. It's how we should think. And so he says, if I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again. Verse 26, but if he thus say, I have no delight in thee. David's prepared for both options. He hasn't shut the door and said, you know, Lord, it has to be that way. And every other way, well, that's not what I want, so that can't be God's will. David saying, well, I would like to go to Jerusalem. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. If God has no delight in me to send me back, then let the Lord do with me what seems right unto him. If I paraphrase really what that sentence is saying. And here is a crucial aspect of how, as Christians, if we are believers this morning, I trust we are, if we're not, we need to get to Christ, first of all. But if we're in Christ, it's how we respond to the will of God that we remember. And I want to make this a very uh, important point this morning. The will of God is sovereign. And in a sense, independent of us. That God's will is not bound by our will. It is his will. And the believer is someone who is not dragging God into the, to their situation, Lord, let your will. No, let it be my will. No, it's, what's your will? Let, let God do what is right and pleasing in his eyes. We do not regard, and again, this is important, we do not regard or view God's will as some people, some factions decide to do in a sort of fatalistic manner. You know, well, whatever happens, happens. And that's not what we're teaching. We certainly don't believe that. We don't just leave it to random chance and events. It's positive. It's God's will is right. God's will is good. God's will is holy. God's will is best for me. 
It's not just whatever's going to happen will happen. It's God's will be done. And so we say like David, let him do as what seemeth good unto him. And there is this holy readiness to say, here am I. You see where David puts himself in the center of that very expression, doesn't he? It's not at the end, it's not the beginning. He says in verse 26, if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, he wedges himself in the middle. I'm ready to stand there in the middle of that. Behold, I'm there. Let him do to me as seemeth good to him. And so further, this is how we then pray. And it's a very important, uh, necessary act of our prayer. That we're not saying, Lord, these are all the things I want. Let them be your will. And that's the, the thinking of many, isn't it? Lord, I need this. It must be your will. If it's not, well, I'm not going to pray. No, Lord, what's your will? Let it be good unto me. Let me be there in the middle of it. Do what's right. Do what's good in your sight. And so uh, we see that the center of God's will or God's will for life should be central in all things. Matthew Henry said this. I think it's a very good quote. Uh, Matthew Henry, he drew attention to not only that God can do what he will, which of course he can, he's all powerful, or that he has a right to do what he will, but that he will do all that he wills. And there's blessed comfort in that, Christian. God will do all that he wills. For you and me, it's Lord let him do what seemeth good unto me. And then finally, we can say that this last feature in true fellowship with God is that we ensure that the contrition, repentance of sin and remorse for our ways never obstructs the worship of God. That if we have sinned and we've sought to renew ourselves in fellowship, that we don't hide ourselves away from the worship of God. And again, it might not be a usual thing that you think of in fellowship with God, but I'm staying true to the passage which is here before us this morning. It is as David goes on and continues his journey that you will discover two legitimate sides to his fellowship with God appear once again. On the first hand, we see the remorse and the mourning and the weeping and the grief that is there because of his sin. And then we see also the readiness and the desire to worship the King of glory. We see, first of all, his weeping and his mourning in verse 30. David went up, verse 30, by the ascent of Mount Olivet, or the Mount of Olives, we could say, and he wept as he went. You can sort of picture the scene, can't you now? It's a very vivid, descriptive verse. He's, he's sent people away. The Levites aren't there anymore. Abiathar's not there. The high priest Zadok's not there. Others may not have been there as well. Some have stayed with David. They're following on. And they send up this very historical, significant hill of God. They send up the, the Mount of Olives, and you have then the, the ways in which his, his repentance is displayed in a sort of a physical form. His head is covered, and he's barefoot. And all the people are doing the same thing. They're mourning with him. They're grieving with him. Why, David? Why are you so filled with grief? Do you know why? Because he can't escape he can't escape the impressions and the burden of guilt when he senses his own shame. It seems to be at this stage of David's life that every action he takes, every decision he makes, everything he sees is just reminding him, thou art the man. Your sin has separated you between you and your God. And he's not taking this lightly, even though he knows the pardon of God. And he's forgiven, he's repented, he's right with God. In that respect, he's not just dismissed this to one side. You know, some people wonder, I think some of you even said this in response to certain sermons I've been saying, that, you know, it's almost impossible to think, well, how could David do what he did? How could he? But very few Christians display the type of repentance for sin that David did. How often we, we've done this, and I think we all put our hand in the air, I'm not saying do it, but we all do it sort of in a sense. And when we've sinned against God, we've confessed our sin, and we've been very quick to forget. I'm not saying that you bog yourself down with misery and anguish and worry and a sense of doom and fear in your life. But there should always be in the background this aching pain that I have grieved him. 
but I have sinned against him. And I think this is really what David is doing here. He's not trying to find forgiveness. He's not sort of doing acts of of penance, but he's trying to inflict pain upon himself and please God, as of course uh, was often taught in the uh, times past and even in previous times, people tried to work their way to heaven. He's not doing any of these things. He's a man of grace. You see that in very the, the words of verse 25 when he speaks of the favor of God. That's the sign of grace. He understands what grace is and God's good pleasure. But he's not going to just think of his sin lightly, even if it's under the blood. It causes him pain, and when he thinks about it, it makes him to weep. And what it cost our Lord, how it should do the very same thing. And I think when you think of the Mount of Olives, it takes us, Christian, to Calvary. It takes us to him. It takes us to what he suffered. Look, look, not, this is not my message for this morning, but I believe it's necessary to say it. We come to the Lord's table, and it should not be with a hard heart. I'm not saying that you forge tears and you show people that you weep, but in a sort of proverbial sense, it shouldn't be with dry eyes. Every wound that he bears and every cry which ascended up from his mouth and every moment of that darkness in which he endured the eternal wrath of God against his soul to purchase your eternal redemption. My sin, my sin. Not in part, but the whole. It's nailed to his cross. I bear it no more. We can praise him. But we ought to have this this deep mourning, it then provides for us in David's life one of the most poignant experiences. Do you know why? Because when David looks behind him, people are there and they're doing the very same thing. They've they've gone up the Mount of Olives with David and they're mourning with David and they're grieving with David. And you know when I thought of that particular feature in David's life, it brought to my attention very quickly the words of Paul in Romans 12, verse 15 and 16. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. That's what the word of God says. Is it not tragic? Is it not one of the great pains of the professing body of Jesus Christ that when certain believers fall away and then seek to renew themselves in repentance and go on with God that instead of finding company and support and an understanding heart and of individuals that will weep with them and put the arm around them and walk with them and encourage them, all they find is people gossiping and whispering and saying, well, do you know what that person's done? And they haven't looked at their own heart. Here are a men and a people, and they're with David. It's not their sin, is it? They don't have to do these things, but they're one with him. Am I, if you are one with Christ as the living head, you will be one with the body, because the head is not severed from the body. And you will suffer with them. And when they rejoice, you rejoice. When God blesses other churches and individuals and God is moving, we don't say, well, you know, wish that was us. We rejoice, don't we? Thank God he's blessing, adding to the church, even if it's not so with us. And and if believers are weeping, you weep with them. And if they're repentant, in a sense, you repent with them. You go with them all the way. That's the feature of true fellowship with God. Weeping. But then finally, we see the worshipping. I came across a quote I put on on the internet as well. I thought it was a very powerful quote by Arthur Pink. He says that weeping and mourning should not hinder worship. We may worship God in the minor key as truly as in the major key. Now, we've had no keys this morning on the piano. So I don't know if I've uh, started in major or minor or in between or some other new key. I don't know. But... Uh, When it comes to the spiritual application, what a tremendous quote that is. Christian, you can worship God in all situations, as Pink says, in the minor as well as in the major. You're not worshipping God more or in a better fashion when it's all well. And your worship of God is not more holy when you are in grief and in pain. The reality is we always must be in worship. We must worship him at all times. Why do I say that? Well, look at verse 32, and I'll bring my message to a close here at this stage. In verse 32, it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount, 
where he worshipped God. Where he worshipped God. Behold, Hushai the archetype came to meet him. He knows that even though he's ascending in grief, he ascends to God. He worships the Almighty. Believer, don't be like many who, when they are in similar situations, they take a holiday from the worship of God. And they take a break from thinking they're a Christian. And then they try to resume it halfway down the line. That's what the Satan would want you to do. You know, in your weeping, you are instant in worship, instant in prayer, instant in coming to God. That's what David did. That's what we commend him for. David, by the way, is not entirely without fault here. Some commentators, maybe some of the more harder ones, but I have to probably agree with what they say here. Some of the commentators believe that his words to Hushai at the end really amounted to him asking this individual, Hushai the archite, to lie and to pretend, to feign again, as David did himself, and to try to defeat the council of Hithophel by sort of craft and guile. So again, it makes us realize that even though David has sought the will of God and David is ascending to worship God, if this is the case and the advice is not right and not the, the honorable thing that should have been done, it just again reminds us it doesn't take very much doesn't take very much. And again, we go down. And again, we find ourselves being tempted in all sorts of different ways. But I'm not going to major upon that particular point, but it's certainly worth keeping in mind. What I encourage you with as a sign of true fellowship with God is this. And again, it's a message for the new year, irrespective of your setbacks and your own unfaithfulness. We don't throw in the towel. We don't lift up our arms and hands in despair and and think, well, no longer can we walk with him. True fellowship with God prioritizes the glory of God. It centers the will of God in their life. And it will not allow uh, weeping and mourning to prevent our true worship of God. It's all part of our spiritual maturity, friend. All part of growing in grace. May the Lord give us grace to go on with him. May he bless his word to our hearts. Amen.